I'm Tamima and this is a Real Talk special. I've lined up for you a very special show today where I'll be taking you behind the scenes on the making of the show, sharing with you how we come up with the ideas for the topics, how we pick the guests, who the most memorable guests on this season have been, and of course, the lessons that we've learned along the way. Welcome to the show. What was it like hosting the first show? Okay, so I've done TV, I've done shows before, and I like to think that every show is like a different pair of shoes, a different outfit. So obviously they're nerves, they're nerves, but I believe that when you stay ready, you don't need to get ready. This is something that I've always wanted to do, host a talk show, but saying that I want to host a talk show and actually hosting a talk show are two very different things, I'll tell you that for free. And my first show for me, there were a lot of nerves, but I remembered why it is that we wanted to do that show, why it is that in that moment, God chose me to be in that chair talking about those topics. And with that, it was very easy just to connect because it's not scripted. I just have conversations with my guests and my entire career, whether as a writer, as a TV presenter, my best parts are always the interviews, getting to know someone. So my first show was memorable in that the topic, rip. I cried on my first show. But at the same time, it was the first step in a very beautiful journey. And I want to thank you so much for walking in that journey with me by tuning in every week to Real Talk with Tamima. Uh, one of our first shows was I Was Raped, It Can Happen to You, a very strong topic. And the reason why we chose that episode as our first show, because in a lot of ways it was how we were letting everybody know that this is what this show is going to be about. It's going to be a show that really goes there. It's going to be a show that's not going to hold back. And a lot of you guys might not know this, but what we shot initially didn't make it on air because we had some few technical challenges. But I'll never forget that one of the most powerful moments in that, we were doing a show on rape, and we actually got men who had raped before. So these are former reformed rapists. They came on the show. And there was this one guy who came on the show and he, he confessed. He was like, I've raped women. I was part of a gang. I raped women before and I regret it. And regret from a point of sitting here, listening to women talk and seeing the pain with which they're talking from. As a former rapist, I feel horrible. And this was the guy who even went as far as telling us he was a father. He had a daughter. So the thought of someone doing to his daughter what he had done to other women earlier on in his life and then also we had somebody whose sister had been raped and she died. So having women who were raped, having confessed rapists, and then having somebody who had suffered as a result of rape all in one show and all of them coming to a place of forgiveness whereby the women who were raped actually acknowledged the fact that you're a reformed rapist and for you to come here to apologize, we accept the apology. And for the guy who lost his sister to actually say that I forgive you because he was crying. The guy was literally crying. And I think we have those clips for you. Take a look. Rape is the most highly underreported crime in Kenya. It is estimated that only one out of 20 women in Kenya will report a rape and only one in six will seek medical assistance. Relying on reported cases will therefore not provide a genuine picture of what is truly happening on the ground. Tonight, we get real on rape. Is this attitude slowly becoming a culture of sexual assault and silence? Jackie, you are a survivor of rape. Please tell us about your story. Okay, mine happened in a relationship. I had been dating this guy for about two months. And uh, before I entered the relationship, we had agreed. I had talked to him about my situation. and I What had was your situation? Him, um, my situation was I wasn't ready to be intimate with him anytime soon. And he had agreed that we would just have a relationship without the sexual part of it, at least at that particular time. So two, uh, around two months into the relationship, he invited me into his house. When I got there, he actually made, you know, prepare, it, was around, it was in the afternoon. He prepared lunch, we, we, we took the lunch. When I saw him closing the doors, of course I knew something was up. So I asked him why, what, you know, why was he locking the door? He was like, you are my girlfriend and you cannot deny me, you know, sex. I started screaming, you know. And nobody heard you? Nobody heard me. So he kind of tore my clothes down and raped me. What happened afterwards? He wanted to lock me in the house. 
he said I was now his woman. He wanted to marry me, you know, at that time. And he was like, I was never going to leave that house unless I agreed that, you know, whatever he did was right. It took about two hours trying to convince him, you know, to let me out because I was scared. He looked to me like, you know, he was, you know, he was wild. He was a different kind of a person at that time. So looking back at the episodes that we did touching on rape and uh, gender-based violence, I had some very memorable guests. Uh, first was Beatrice Minor. Beatrice was sexually abused as a child. And really, for me, that is the one guest that made me cry. That's the moment that I cried. So, Beatrice, the first time you were assaulted, you shared with us that it was by a close family member. Is this a man that you have seen since? I've never gone back there since then. I don't even attend a family gathering. Just to avoid him? Yeah. What would happen if you met him today? Nothing at all. You're not only a rape survivor. You're also working to counsel other people who have been through what you went through. So clearly for me, that is the strongest mark of a survivor. So you went through it, you've overcome. So what would you say to anyone who's watching, even a young girl who has been sexually assaulted and somebody told her, Okisema, nitakuchapa, nitakuwa, utamuambia aje. Rape is real. At first you can downplay the feeling. You think that you are okay. But it eats you up slowly by slowly until you learn to speak about it. Find someone who you trust, someone who can listen to you, and someone who can help you out. Looking into this grown woman's eyes, to her talking about how she was raped as a child at nine years old, not once, but twice, and seeing that in that moment, in the present, she had not quite gotten over it. So it just makes you understand how deep a crime rape is, whether it's happening to a child, a grown woman, it's a culture that we must stop. I was sexually assaulted when I was 10 by my uncle back in Moranga. By then my parents had moved to Nairobi and they had left us under the care of our grandma. That's when we, we had some duties. I was to clean the house, that's to sweep the house and clean the utensils. So one day, my dad's brother came back earlier than before. He told me to sweep his bedroom and lay his bed, which I had already done. When I, I, I told him I had done that, he told me, no, go do it again. And I did it, I came back and told him I had done it. Were you the only one in the house with him at the time? Yeah. All your other siblings were out playing? No, they had gone to the farm. Okay. Yeah. So, he told me to go back again and do it. When I went back, he followed me. To his bedroom? Yeah. Threw me on his bed and assaulted me. At 10 years old? Yeah, at 10. What happened afterwards? He threw me out of his bedroom. I went to the bathroom, did several showers, and then went back to our room where we used to sleep. That day, I remember I slept earlier than before, and my sister came back. Actually, my uncle told me, if I told anyone about what had happened, he would kill me. And marriage at this point was really, you guys had decided, let's come and stay Actually, together. Actually, it's just a karma safe thing. But it, it was marriage for you yeah, guys, because you are committed. Because I'm committed to right. him, and now I'm already known that I'm pregnant, and my prayer and my thing was I cannot be away from the husband, from the father of my child. I have mm. to be in a place where my baby will be born with my dad, with the father, you know, and we raise our child together. So in this case, when he realized that I was pregnant, he changes. He could come home after two weeks. Mm -hmm. He disappears. After two weeks, he comes. So when he comes home, you know, sometimes with pregnancy comes with different issues. So right. mine... I had, I had a problem. So the doctor said, for now, you cannot be able to have intercourse until the pregnancy is four months. For him, it was a different case. He said, no, you are my wife and I have to have it. So not understanding that you have a vulnerable pregnancy. He, he didn't, didn't care. He didn't. Okay. He did, he did not. So him, he could come home, drunk, sometimes even sober, and take me, uh, dash me to bed, tie my legs, and rape me. 
So it reached a point whereby I, th I think he was tired of raping me in one, in one, one way. Yeah? He said, now since the doctor doesn't want me to use this side, I right. can use the other side. Right. So to me it was a very difficult thing because you're pregnant. I've, I've been hearing stories that when you're pregnant and someone is abusing you, the other side can have to can can challenge. Absolutely. Actually, they are during your birth. But I would tell myself, no, it will not happen in my case. So the cases, the thing continu continues for a longer period. Did you share with anyone at that point? I Friends, I family? Could, I could not share with anyone because now in this time, once he, I married to him, he took my phone. He told me no co communicating with your siblings. Actually, he could escort me to work. Wait for me. Yani, Jamal is quite insecure. Yes, wait for me. Come with me home. You know, he could monitor my steps. So no calls for me. If I have to make any calls, I have to make a call when I'm at work. Then also, I remember Terry Wafula. Terry's story for me really was something that I still carry to date because it's painful how even her own family didn't believe her. She told them she was raped by the pastor and he was able to buy their silence by paying for her brother's school fees. So really it's a moment that makes all of us question who are we, who are we as a society? And it makes us realize that if you have a voice, use it. If you can speak up for someone, speak up for someone. And if you have a relative or a friend who's gone through this, I can tell you for a fact, believing them, is the first step to their recovery and get them the help that they need. My first guest is Terry Wafula. Terry is 29 years old. So Terry, tell me, uh, what did you go through? I went through defilement. It was done by a pastor. And on talking about it, he was kind of cunning. So he went to church and said he, he was shown by God that someone was paying me to kill his ministry. So. At the, at the time, is this somebody who your family trusted? They still trust him until today. Do, are they aware of the abuse that you went through at his hands? Yes. And they still trust him to date? Yes. How does that make you feel? It's, it's, uh, it feels like a betrayal. Yeah. So this man took advantage of you because obviously at 13 years old, he's a pastor, he's somebody that you trusted. Is it something that he has seen? Is it something that he did once, or is it something that he did repeatedly? Okay, he did once, although he had intentions like of doing uh, more than once. Tell me about the day it happened. Okay, it was one Saturday. Had uh, we had met in church, and then I had an issue like I needed to pay for my KCP and my parents were not there. So he told me, you can come we talk over the same issue at home. So that's when it happened. When you say at home now, at his home? Yes. And did you report it to anyone on that day? No, okay. The person I told was the person who came, the first one in the house. Now to the pastor's home? Yes, because mm -hmm. him he finished and then he was like, I'm so sorry, I'm human and all that. You know, like, don't tell anyone if you don't, I'll pay your school fees and all that. He promised a lot of things. So he was bribing you? Yes. So the person who entered the first one was a member of his church. She was a lady. So she, she found me, I was messed up. So she asked what had happened. I explained to her, but she, she didn't do anything. She just told me to like, clean my clothes. And then she brought me, she was a neighbor to the pastor. So she brought me the, some new clothes, her clothes, mm -hmm. clean clothes, then I washed mine. And then when you went home, did you tell anybody at home about it? No. Why? <laughs> okay, my parents were not there at mm -hmm. first, and then I was feeling embarrassed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, thereafter, is this a man that you saw often? Did you keep going to his church? Uh, I dropped church, okay, after he, he said, you know, like he was pay, someone was, had pay, paid me to do that. I, I felt betrayed. I yeah. can imagine. And I felt, you know, I never felt like going to church again. Yeah. Do you think that this is something that he had done to other young girls like yourself before? I believe so, yeah. And to date, has this man paid for his sins? No. So how does that make you feel, walking around knowing that he's still walking around, no action taken? I've gone through counseling, yeah. but initially I'll feel like he deserved death or something. Uh, because he was this happy person, he's talking about his daughters, and you know the plans he has for his daughters, and he chose to hurt me. Uh, he has daughters around your age? 
uh, younger, younger than my age. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think it is that uh, your family and probably your church community did not choose to believe you? From where I come from, such issues are not taken seriously, like defilement, rape. I didn't see anyone actually like even coming to talk to me about what had happened. We did a topic on divorce and separation and why we chose to do this topic was simply because we live in a society where there is so much pressure to get married and especially for women to have that big white wedding but nobody ever really talks to you about how do you leave a bad relationship? How do you get of, how do you know that this is a bad marriage? How do you know that I have to leave this? And I was so proud of my guests, Emma, Lillian, coming on the show and just sharing about how their fairy tale turned into a nightmare and how they were able to get over the level of heart that they went through. For Emma, especially the fact that in the beginning, she confessed that she couldn't stand the sight of brides. But today, she emcees at weddings. Emma is 44 years old, and she has also lived through divorce. Emma, welcome to the show. Thank you. So probably just tell us, how did you find yourself going through separation and then finally div divorce? Um, I got married at the age of 25 in a church wedding to a very handsome uh, dude from Dodoma, Tanzania. Kiswahili kili kuchanganyisha pale. So down the line, many things happened after we got our first baby. And this is not to bring him down or to ridicule him. By the end of the day, he's still the father of my children. In those eight years, there was a lot of promiscuity. But uh, what happened is now, when uh, how I got myself into it, is that when I was expectant now of our second baby, he left in the name of uh, Green Pastures to Dubai. I then got the baby during the post-election skirmishes. I got a baby boy, I thank God for him. And uh, I, I now later discovered that he had another family. So you get to hear through other people his No, I didn't hear through other people. He informed you himself? No, he came visiting. Okay. And uh, in a few minutes asked for the daughter so that they go and buy a certain gadget. Uh, to, it was a gift to the girl. And then he had forgotten money in the house and sent the girl to pick the money through us checking through his bag. And then I came across a second marriage certificate. We also got a birth certificate mm. of the baby. Did you confront him? I did not confront him, but I asked questions. And uh, the questions that I asked, he was not willing to answer. He became violent and just packed and left. So how did this man mm. then end up taking a second wife? Mm -hmm. Was it because it was in Dubai, he thought he could get away with it? No, he left the, with the lady from here. So how was he able to have two marriages? Now, this is how I got to know uh, uh, about the two certificates. First and foremost, I saw the second one with my eyes. But secondly, when I was trying to pursue maintenance of the children and school fees, because I was in a place where I was really struggling, because I was, uh, by the time he was living, we were living in Buruburu in an expensive house and I had to downgrade and go to a cheaper house for me to manage the bills being that now I was now introducing myself to being the breadwinner. So when I was trying to pursue maintenance, there is a time now I had to go legal and look for a lawyer to help me on, even if he's going to deposit the school fees in the school account direct. To me, that was fine. I even traveled to his home to see his uh, sisters to persuade him to just pay school fees direct to the school account, and still that was not forthcoming. So at this point, probably, did you try maybe sending your family to talk to his family? You know, ki Africa, ki Mile, in Africa, yes. wakati, you're like, you know what, let me just call in the elders. Yeah, I have, I, have, I have brothers whom I try to use to persuade, and things were not just working. <laughs> at the point that you guys initially separated, how mm. old were the kids? The girl, the firstborn was in standard four, and uh, the boy, I was pregnant. At any point, other than him insulting you, did he come out and say, I want a divorce to you? He told me he has a new family, and I, I, I pick up myself and move from there. That's when I now decided to go legal, just to get the divorce. assistance. And again, yeah. I had seen the second marriage certificate. Then when I went to see this lawyer, the lawyer sent me to go to Sharia House to ascertain if why? Why the two papers? And then there was Lillian Hamisi. Lillian for me was memorable because of A, her age, but most importantly because of how vulnerable she was willing to be, that she was willing to confess to us. Despite the fact that she was heartbroken in her 20s, 
She stayed single for over 30 years raising her kids. But today, her kids are grown up, have their own families, have their own lives, and she felt lonely. And she was hoping that somebody would come along, you know, somebody for her. And it just goes to prove that no matter how, how much we might want to deny it, there is a reason God made man and woman. There is a reason why we thrive in relationships. And I really believe that that was a show that was packed with a lot of lessons, a lot of healing, just to show anyone that even if you're in a bad relationship, don't give up. There's somebody out there for you. She was married almost, you said, over 25 years ago. Yes. And since then, you have not been interested in coupling up? No. Not in any a relationship. Well, they were tenor, and I've never had even a man friend. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly a demonstration that different people deal with separation differently. Because for her, it was easier to just cut out that part of her life. But, and which is okay because also society, society puts pressure on women that at a certain age you must be married, you must have a man, and she's been able to tell us the kind of life she's lived. She's happy, her children are happy. But let me say this. When you are having your children, you are happy. But when they are getting out, now I'm feeling lonely. <laughs> <laughs> that is the truth. Now I'm feeling yes. lonely. If I can get somebody saying, Lillian, I want to marry you and we live like this, but not a poor man, I want somebody. <laughs> so we touched on the topic pregnant and single, and mostly it was from a need point of view because the statistics are worrying. There's so many young girls getting pregnant out of wedlock, and I hate using that word, out of wedlock, because the reality is we live in different times. But how else do you put it when a girl gets pregnant, she's not married, the man is not willing to take responsibility, which unfortunately is the reality in today's world. We have so many young people having sex, not knowing that the responsibility that comes out of sex sometimes can be a child. So we had girls coming on the show sharing about how, because of one mistake, some of them even one night stands, they got pregnant, now they have children to show for that, and some of the fathers are nowhere to be seen. But one girl stayed with me, Rita because Rita confessed to us that she got pregnant while she was in campus and she had not told her parents. And I remember asking her, Rita, you realize you're on TV talking about this. If you've never told your parents and you're telling me on TV, your parents will know about it. And you could tell in the moment, it's when it hit her, oh my God, the fact that I'm on this show, somebody's gonna see it and they're gonna find out about it at home. And what we usually do in such moments, because even for some of the guests, because the show is very honest, very candid, they don't mean to share some of what they share when they come on. It's just that when we get talking and it becomes a very you know, intimate conversation, they end up really just getting real with us. So usually what we do because the show is pre-recorded, we give them time. So we'll tell them that this show is gonna air like in two weeks time. So go, tell mom, tell dad, you know, get real because we also don't want them to be caught off guard by hearing about it from other people that your son or your daughter was on TV talking about this and you know nothing about it. Rita, welcome to the show. So you had a similar experience to the ladies who had shared their, story, their stories with us earlier, Alice and Sheila, but your outcome was very different. Maybe just walk us through that. How old were you when you got pregnant? I was in the campus first year. And he was 19 then. And then there is this boy when you are to Joanna from Akituli up and Kuko in the same campus. You were study course more or different Not courses? Not really a different course, but we had knew each other before. How old was he? He was 23 then. And you were 18? 19. 19. Yeah. So it was like, I mean, he likes to have a relationship. Okay, it took some days, uh, like, I have to do this because I require too much persistence, and yeah. When you say you have to do this, that means being intimate with him in the relationship. Okay, like, I too, I really liked him, because and I knew him as a good person. He was nice to me, yeah. He was your first boyfriend? I think, yes, he was. By then I was living alone. I was a camp in Salimia, and those were in campus, you no know, things called sleepovers and stuff. I was a camp sleepover too. I was a camp sleepover too. I was a camp solo. Yeah, and then I was in a relationship, in our relationship for like six months there. And then, okay, I, I, got, I had some feelings that maybe I'm pregnant. I went to Nikapima, 
nikapata yes nikatafuta courage ni i texted him nikamwambia you know what i'm pregnant kwa text yeah and he was like oh no let me just come to ndetu pima na wewe then we went to kapima nikapata yes i'm pregnant from there akakuwa a totally different person from the person i knew different kiaje like akanza akanza ku behave weird akanza kusema like have, lately nimeanza ku behave weird pia mimi so i didn't get it yeah nika take it in nikamuliza so like kuna maanisha this is not your ball ama akanembea he doesn't think so so i was like okay so i nika peke yangu place nikafikiria now what am what am i going to do because i knew how my parents will react to this and two siko anataka kuambia pia so i was like okay now how am i going to do it okay i decided to tell my sister uh, my older sister because i knew she was good and she maybe she could help me yeah so bado nikasikia no i'm not going to tell her right now acha kwanza nikai kai ni jo what i'm going to do but then i was so stressed like siko na idea kitu nitafanya telling my parents could could be worse could be hell so mimi nika like nika car for like two months niko na ball inaendelea kuwa kubwa i was stressed nilikuwa na na depend on the pocket money that parents were calling to me from home and maybe my sister yeah yeah so like two in the third month nika car pia sija gain courage ya kuongea na msiz so like nika car pia in the fourth month pia nika, okay there was this my best friend of mine tunasoma na ye pia the same course nikamuita kwangu nikamwambia nika juu okay definitely alikuwa anaona na nime change lately i'm not me i'm living another totally different life yeah so nikamuita akakam so she was the first person you told she outside the, of your boyfriend that yeah. you're pregnant yeah after four months yeah no she told me okay i told her to help me out and she told me that niambie sister yangu ni sirash kwambia parents cuz i don't know what's going to happen next oh uh, in the fifth month nikaenda nikaongelesha sister yangu and the first thing nilimwambia sa to limit me don't tell mom please so she was like yes i won't tell mom okay like i know how she is and i know how she'll react and she'll be like i'm kind of useless you get how am i getting pregnant in first year even so like i told her the whole story okay my sister knew the boy he knew him still as a good person yeah so like nikambia sister yangu sister yangu akani 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 advice akaniambia like usikuwe na stress all gonna be well but still nilikuwa na back in my mind nilikuwa I, i was thinking about my parents i was thinking about my both parents na pia nilikuwa na try kuona ni nini wataona about me still unaona pia nilikuwa na like nilikuwa i was guilty because my sister tumeachana na almost 10 years na ajai kuwa na kind of story na niko hapo and then ndo mimi we were missing everything so uliona kama ume disappoint family yako yeah that was my first thought that came in my mind so just to follow up on the pregnant and single show we did a show called blended families and we had guests who were coming on the show to share how they've been able to make their blended families work and it came from a point of realizing today in our society because we have a lot of single parents both male and female So at some point when a single parent needs to settle down with somebody and they are coming with kids. And I remember Agnes specifically because for Agnes her husband came with five. She came with two. Together they made one. In total they have eight kids. And looking at Agnes you'd never guess that she's a mother of eight kids. But they made it work. Beautiful love story and especially when her child, you know, and I say child not stepchild because really she's been a mother to her. Came on the show and just told her showed gratitude you know for the for the influence for the love that she gave her same love like she received from her biological mother i met my husband when he was already a father of five and at that point i had two kids of my own and then together we have since had a child together so 5 plus 2 plus 1 Eight. Because eight. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I'm curious yeah. and uh, you said your husband's name is Charles. Yes, my husband's name is Charles. When you met Charles at first, obviously he caught your attention. 
So you guys were there dating, vibing. Yes. At that point, did you know he has five kids? Yes. So, so from the very beginning, um, Charles was an active parent to his children. And so even in our dating, the conversation around his children came up. And I knew I was talking to a father of five. My name is Peter Mwangi, and my opinion on blended families is that on the side of the kids, on the biasness towards a certain child. Okay, my name is Alex, and uh, my view is this thing of stepfather, stepmother, it affects the children, especially the ones for the older mother. So my name is Steve, Steve Andrew Mwangi. Uh, I think the biggest challenge that blended families go through actually is acceptance. You see like the attention of the dad goes so much to the children uh, who of uh, children of the upcoming mother. Yeah. Kids who are favored more than others. The kids who are part of the stepdad or the stepmama I may say a child with the mother no but also the kid and by any estranged. So chances are on a poga either one of a favored or one of less favored from the parents, you know, the other half parents. Someone like me, that's what I went through, you know, being brought up by, not really my dad, but someone else. You know, it was the biggest challenge and I could accept as one of your own. You know, someone who's there for you, to support you, kulipa fee, unajua to stand with you, like you need cash, you're in problems, like that man-to-man -man talk, Sijai experience you. So I think the biggest problem to me, that would be acceptance from the, the other parents, which are not no favorism, so some kids want to end up working on self-esteem issues and such kind of things. No, no. So at the end of the day, think yani kuna koga na major. You know the biggest challenge. Yeah. But because children are anga makosa, you know, children, you just flow with anything. You should, you give them love, you give them everything, they are good to go. But parents, ile kitu na hold sana, as in kuna usi wako and you take it. It's the biggest thing. So acceptance. So I have with me Imelda. Imelda is actually the oldest child in uh, Agnes's family. So Imelda, how are you? I'm fine. For you, as a child who's grown up in a blended family, what's the experience been like? Um, for me, I think there are three things that have guided me. Number one is my mom. She's always made it clear that uh, my dad has his life and it's okay to move on. So when she came into our family, she did not come in as an enemy. So that mattered. Secondly, it was clear. She made dad happy. She made him a better father to all of us. The way we connect with him now that she's there is way much better than when it was just us alone. So there's that. Then. Number three, she's just amazing. She's my friend, first of all. She's my mentor. This is the person I want to be when I grow up. So those three things have made me accept it. She's a mom, basically. Wow. Yeah. Agnes, <laughs> you also one of Agnes's children. Agnes has eight children, guys, in case you're just <laughs> tuning in right now. Eh? So Frank, what has the experience been like for you? It's been perfect, actually. I wouldn't complain. So as Imelda said earlier, she has helped our father progress in so many ways. And I've always wanted to have younger siblings, and they're so charming. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. also, we have one of the younger ones, Abby. Hi. Hi. How are you today? I'm fine, thank What do you want to say? My name is Abby, and I love family. Aww. And then also we had Kevin. Now Kevin's story is very unique in that I don't okay, I don't really think it's unique. Kevin's story is interesting in that it's very commonplace nowadays. Boy meets girl. Boy falls in love with girl. Girl has kids, doesn't tell boy until boy is head over heels in love with a girl. What to do? You meet a woman, she has kids, she hides it from you. You only come to find out much later that she has children. So that was Kevin, and I love the fact that he was man enough to still stay. But we have to question, as a society, why do we put pressure on women to hide the fact that they have children? Does it mean that if a woman has a child, she can't get married? She doesn't deserve a second shot at love? 
that was an episode where we really wanted to challenge that mentality and to make everyone realize that family is really where the heart is. Nilipatana na Lucy miaka 3 iliyopita na mimi mimi ni mwanabiashara nafanya kazi ya kuuza viatu. So mali nilikuwa na uzanga viatu alikuwa na kujanga alikuwa na alikuwa na uza maji then akakuja akaanza kuuza mayai, smoky. So most of the time alikuwa anapenda kunuzia mayai. Jimu penda mayai sana. <laughs> So tukaanza tukuongea hivyo pole pole na mchokoza chokoza so jomo nume lazima uchokoze kidogo <laughs> eh, sasa ili, lakini nilichukua muda ilichukua muda ilichukua karibu mwezi mmoja hivi akukwambia kuna watu wengi kidate yes hakuniambia akona watu wengi kidate aliogopa pengine ukijua akona watu hii hiyo story ingeisha hapo hapo yeah yeah it's true so alimkoteza zile umechanganyikiwa proper eh <laughs> 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 okay sasa venye alikuwa na kapeke yake no alikuwa na kana sister yake then akakuja akaanza kwa kapeke yake so nikamwambia bado kwa kapeke yako na we are in a relationship kuja tuanze kuishi na yeye tujenge mai tujijenge kimaisha so as long we tukona inzile kuishi kuishi tufanya kifanya biashara yangu yeye akaanza kufanya kazi ya cleaning hivyo tunasaidiana akakuja akapata mimba sasa mimba yangu after kupata mimba yangu hapo sasa ndio niniambia ukweli lakini mi kwangu ilini iliniuma juu niliona so ana alikuwa hivyo alikuwa anangoja apate mimba yangu ni aniambie ako na watoto watatu na watoto watatu walikuwa muacha nyumbani kwa mama yake nyumbani sasa ushago eh ushago okay ilichukua muda kabla ni ni take sasa juu sasa okay ishakuwa ishakuwa ni bibi yangu ako na mimba yangu so tu hivyo tulikana naye tukakana naye tukakana naye so ni kama mbenda kuona watoto sasa so, hiyo ni kabla azae huyu mtoto wangu. Ndio sasa akapiga simu watoto wakaletwa nikawaona. Wasichana watatu. Eh sasa mimi wangu tulienda tukafanya scanning, nina nini tukakuja tukapata ni kijana. Then akakuja kaza. Eh so tuko na wasichana watatu kijana wangu mmoja. Lakini wote ni watoto wangu wote. Ah. Eh. Wow, I think my one of my best best episodes was Man Talk. And the idea from this came from the fact that when you say I'm doing a talk show, everyone is like, okay, it's a women's show. But I love that we've really been able to challenge that conception. In fact, a lot of the times my guests are men. My audience is full of men as well. I've noticed that through the entire first season. But for Man Talk, it was interesting because I was literally the only woman on set. My audience was full of men. My panel was full of men and it was interesting just to understand what do men want? What do men think? How does a man feel about certain issues? I'm a woman. I'm clueless on this and I really appreciate the likes of Chris Kiroa, you know, the likes of Michael Oyer for coming on the show. But the one moment that had guys going and I tell you guys this, it took a lot of restraint for me. There is something that Mwakideo said on the show and he quoted the Bible. And I have to appreciate Diane Masinda because Diane is somebody who's been a counselor on several shows on this past season. But I love how he's able to really come at commonplace issues with a very fresh perspective. Whereby he's not afraid to show that as a man, it's okay to feel, it's okay to care, and it's okay to admit that in some areas you're weak. But I really enjoyed that episode and I really hope to do a follow-up to that one. What do men want? That is a profound question and I'm assuming you're talking within the sphere of relationships. Absolutely. Yes, because there are many things that men want and maybe most of the things are not necessarily within the sphere of relationships. But when we talk about relationships, uh, I would not dare talk on behalf of all men, one. But I may be able to suggest that as complex as women are, so men have their complexities. And because the woman does not understand the way the man is actually communicating, does not mean that he has not put across what he wants. So just on that point, how do men communicate? We use less words. We will say it probably once and say it within a context where we presume that it's being taken very seriously. And we may not repeat it, but what we said in the first instance 
still stand. So, Diane, you've been in the audience this entire time, yes. just listening to the conversation that I've been having with a nice gentleman up here, the good man. Uh -huh. Senior. <laughs> so, <laughs> from the good man, because you, you, you counsel couples, yes. both men and women. So, what is your take on all this? We as men need to know you shouldn't be placed in a situation where you don't want to go. You know, a lot of men are getting married because they just want to please the woman. The second thing that was mentioned was the first thing that uh, men say uh, when, you, when they're dating is very important. That's a yes and a no. Yes, if you're dating a man who's serious about you, what he means is very true. No, sometimes men, when they want to lure a woman into getting something, they will tell the woman what she wants to hear. They'll say all the right they will things. Say all the yes. good things. They will, I've had cases whereby the man says, if you get a child, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with you. We're going to get married. Once the sex happens, they bail. So it depends what kind of a man you're with. I saw uh, men, to our word is final. That is not true. That is where we miss it. Our word is not final. I think we need to interrogate what's the motive of why we get into relationships. Motive is everything. If your motive is to be, um, to be hard in what it is that you say and what it is is final, then that is not marriage. That is not a relationship. Do you guys that agree with him? Uh, Your word is not final? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That was my point. Yes. And this was my point, yes. by the way. In a family setup, or even in a country, yes. Lazima kuna, where the back stops. You understand? Yeah. We will have a discussion, of course. We will talk about it. I'll raise the issue. We will to have to get three bedroom. All right? From this two bedroom. Why? Because you're having another child. All right? So, I can discuss. We will discuss. When we disagree completely, then whose word is final? I think, we, I think we gentlemen need to, be, need to accept the fact that sometimes we can also be wrong. We can also be wrong. And sometimes women can be right. Just on a point that you've raised there, yeah. on the issue of being on the same level. Yeah. So, you're saying that the man and the woman are not on the same level. Of course. And then bringing and in the context happen. of vile mama wetu walilelewa, have you taken into consideration that it's different times, perhaps different script? Ah, that will never happen. There's never a different time and different script and different scenario and different world. No. So probably in your context, what does it mean to you as a man for me to know that I am a woman? Um, for you to know you're a woman, um, of course, take care of your, yourself as a woman, number one. Um, if you have a boyfriend or a husband, uh, you know, you have to recognize that he's the man of the house. He's the head of the house, and the Bible says so, you understand? And then recognize that um, he makes all the rules, and his word is final, you understand? His word is final? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, even us, when we are growing up, and I'm sure it applies to this gentleman here, there was pressure to live up to the expectation of the girl child, to be able to be looked up to. Um, it was drummed in our ears, depending on the age, yeah, and me, I come from the old school. And we are taught to be men and not to cry, not to show emotion, not to do all these things that you guys accept, expect us to do. So um, if GMO is being told why he doesn't have a ride and James has a ride, then that's already pressure. Do you know what? It will drive this man to even decide to use another doc's means to be able to acquire this ride to be able to be respected. <clears throat> So women look at men as objects of success. There are those who do that. Yeah. And there are also guys who simply want to be with a woman who is all made up and looking all nice just to impress his boys. But deep inside at home, the guy is suffering. But he has to try and look good because each of his friends has this particular woman that everybody looks at and decides, this is the kind of woman I want to marry. Maybe we guys grew up in a better era than the era they are growing because up in right now. Because there was no right social now. media. Yeah, there was no this kind of pressure that yeah. you really have to live up to certain standards. Alex, you, Mokidele, well, you had um, something to say to Dan. Yes, I, I saw so some, something to say, by the way. I had to Google <laughs> that. Even, even Google. Google. <laughs> you know, Ephesians 5.22-23. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, all right? His body of which he is savior, 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in, in everything. everything. 
Listen, Dan. <laughs> Dan, 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 Dan. Well, thank you so much for joining me tonight on this special episode of Real Talk with Tamima. We have another episode lined up for you again tomorrow. Well, until then, that's it from me and the crew. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. <laughs>